Shalom and howdy everybody and welcome back finally to the Midrash series with me Batya in Sfat as usual. You're all gonna have the pleasure of hearing quite a bit of traffic and honking so you're welcome. It's been a very very long time. There's kind of a war happening I'm not even going to talk about anything. I've just missed being here. I've missed the Midrash. Enough jibber jabber. Let's just jump right in, shall we? All right, so I did something horrible to you guys last time. Horrible. I told you the most amazing story about Korach, and he's coming to bring the offerings, and he's at war with Moshe Rabenu. what's going to happen? Well, we kind of know. We kind of know. But let's find out what the Midrash has to say. Let us begin. When Korach and his 250 followers appeared before the Mishkan in the morning, the entire Klal Israel was pr present. Korach's claim that his dispute was for the benefit of the community had won over the people sufficiently that no one voiced any protest. Some people began to believe that, after all, there might be some truth to what Korach's claim is. Maybe Hashem would agree to restore the kahuna to the firstborn. Moshe and Aaron stood at the entrance of the Ohel Moed on one side and Korach and his 250 men on the other. They held pans that had been donated by Korach. He was so wealthy that his household contained 250 suitable pans, which he distributed among his followers. The Shekhinah appeared in the cloud of glory at the entrance of the Ohel Moed, and the Almighty commanded Moshe and Aaron, separate yourselves from the rest of the people, and I shall consume them in an instant. The Almighty's anger was kindled against all the Jews because they had not protested against Korach by casting doubt upon the truth of Moshe's words. The Jews were considered as though they had attacked Hashem. For one who doubts his Rebbe's words is considered as though he has risen up against the Shekhinah. Sanhedrin 110a. Moshe and Aaron fell on their faces and pleaded to Hashem to spare the nation of Israel. They argued, Hashem, you know every person's mind. A human king may have to annihilate all of the people, even if some, only a few, rebel against you because he cannot distinguish the guilty from the innocent. You, however, know that the children of Israel are not rebelling against you. They merely came here because Korach persuaded them to do so. It is only Korach who has rebelled against you. Hashem replied, Your tefillah is accepted. I shall act mercifully towards the people. Only Korach, Datan, Avirum, and their families will be destroyed. Command the people to distance themselves from the tents of these wicked men and to touch nothing of theirs. Once the destroying angel is let loose, he consumes all that he finds in the vicinity of the wicked. Hearing God's decree, Moshe attempted to speak to Datan and Aviram in order to spare them from destruction. Followed by the 70 elders, Moshe himself walked toward Datan and Aviram's tents. He felt certain that they would receive the leader of the nation of Israel respectfully. However, these Rashaim refused to appear at the entrance of their tents to speak to him. Moshe thereupon commanded the nation of Israel according to Hashem's instructions, depart from the tents of these wicked men and touch nothing of theirs, lest you yourselves be destroyed because of their sins. Datan and Aviram occurred the death penalty long ago. In Egypt, they were informers to Paro. At the Yam Suf, they incited their fel at the Yam Suf, they incited their followers to return to Egypt. They went out to gather man on Shabbat, and now they have transgressed Hashem's word. They are brazen, and they instigate strife. When Datan and Aviram saw the Jews retreating from their tents, they finally appeared at the entrances, and along with their wives, showered Moshe with a flood of vile curses and blasphemies. Moshe then addressed the nation of Israel. You will now receive proof that I acted by divine command, when I appointed Aaron Kohen Gadol and his sons Kohenim, and Elitzafan Nasi, president of Bnei Kehas, 
and that all of my other words and actions are dictated by the Almighty alone. If Datan, Aviram, and Korak pass away, as people usually do, from sickness or old age in their beds and their corpses are brought to burial, then what Korak says is true. I will acknowledge and profess that Hashem has not sent me and that I fulfilled the high offices with my own choices. Moshe turned to Hashem and prayed, I ask of you, Hashem, to punish these wicked with a death unique in history. Moshe said Hashem, what do you want me to do? Master of the universe, prayed Moshe, if you have created an entrance to Ge'enom, where these people are standing, well and good. If not, I ask you to perform a miracle. Move the opening of Gehenim to beneath their feet and let them be transported there alive. Then it will be evident to all that they have blasphemed Hashem. The question arises, why Moshe, who usually sought for mercy, right? This is, this is kind of unusual when you're hearing Moshe praying for the death and a wild death of these sinners. It's so interesting because isn't Moshe always the man that's begging for God to forgive the Jews? Now here, he's actively entreating Hashem to punish Korach and his followers with an immediate and unusual death. And this parable might help give some flavor to that. The princess's wedding celebration was underway. The bride commanded universal respect and esteem because it was well known that she was chaste and she was beautiful. Suddenly, a demagogue climbed upon one of the tables and began shouting at the assembly. You are all speaking highly of our bride because you think she's a respectable maiden. If you want to know the truth, listen to me and I could tell you stories about her that should never be mentioned in public. The audience was shocked. Instantly, wild rumors began to circulate in whispers and raise voices. The matchmaker, who knew the princess well from her youth, realized that the defamer was only attempting to draw attention to himself and incite the people for his own purposes. The matchmaker demanded the king, have this man who brazenly slandered the princess beheaded this very instant. If you don't order his immediate execution, I will second his accusations. The king thought, if I delay the defamer's ex execution, people will believe that his accusations are true. Similarly, Moshe proclaimed, unless you, Hashem, punish Korach and his supporters instantly, I will also support his claim. By publicly ridiculing Moshe, Datan and Avram had brought the Torah, like the king's daughter, into disrepute. Korach claimed that some of Moshe's statements were not of divine origin, but of his own creation. Had these defamers gone unpunished for even a short moment, their apocorsis would have spread to the rest of the people. Our belief in the divinity of the Torah is predicated upon the historical fact of Hashem's revelation at Har Sinai before the eyes of the entire nation and Moshe's appointment at his, as Hashem's most divine agent. By denying some of Moshe's statements while Moshe was still alive, Korach and his followers had put the divine origin of their entire Torah into doubt. Others might follow his example by challenging other parts of the Torah and eventually the veracity of the entire Torah would be questionable. Later generations would then certainly doubt the authenticity of the Torah, arguing even in Moshe's generation there were people who didn't think that the Torah was divine. How can we today be certain Who's right, Moshe or Korach? Thus Moshe prayed to Hashem, master of the universe. Had these men merely attacked me or my brother Aaron? I would have remained silent. However, I may not remain silent when it comes to the honor of the Torah. When the honor of the Torah is at stake, he therefore requested that the Almighty make a unique demonstration in the punishment of these men. The very moment Moshe ended, his tefillah. Hashem fulfilled his request. He performed a miracle as spectacular as the creation of the world, which clearly exposed Korach and his company as liars. The earth split open. This is one of the nine, is it nine or ten? It might be nine. Things that was created <clears throat> before the world was made. I think if you go back to the first Midrash video, it will mention it. Or maybe. 
The earth split open, widening gradually where Korok, Datan, and Averim's tent stood. With a powerful suction, it drew them and their families downwards together with their tents and all their belongings. The punishment of Datan and Averim's children illustrates the severity of the sin of causing strife. Usually the heavenly tribunal does not punish anyone younger than 20, and a human beddin does not punish a boy younger than 13. However, in the sin of inciting strife, we say machlochit, even young babies are included in the punishment, as happened in the case of Korach's followers. No trace of these rashaim remained. Whatever they possessed was magnetically drawn into the abyss. Even if one's garment was in the laundry or he had, a, had lint on a small item, such as a needle, to another Jew, it was also drawn into the opening and disappeared. Even if the names of Korach, Datan, and Avim were inscribed on a document, the script miraculously vanished. Whoever supports machlochet, strife, fighting, not peace is blotted out and no memory of him remains. <sighs> Korak's fortune, which had enabled him to create a revolt against Moshe, would be forever lost. He did not even merit that another Jew should perform good deeds with it. As Moshe had requested, the Almighty opened Genom at the bottom of the abyss and transported the Rashaim there alive. And while they were sinking, Bnei Israel heard them confess loudly, Hashem is righteous, his judgment is truthful, and the words of his servant Moshe are true. We are wicked for having rebelled against him. Gehenom has seven compartments, the lowest of which is termed Sheol. These Rashaim descended to Sheol. God created the opening of Gehenom at the bottom of the pit and not at the surface of the earth, lest God's radiation destroy the world. Abba Bar Barchana related, once while he was traveling, he met a man who was actually Eliyahu Anavi in disguise. And he asked him, do you want me to show you the spot where Korach and his followers were swallowed up? And I said, of course I do. And he led me to two openings in the ground from which I saw smoke rising. He brought a piece of moist cotton, stuck it to the edge of a spear and inserted it into the earth. When he pulled it out, it was singed. Now listen carefully, he said. Out of the depths, I heard words. Moshe is true and so is his Torah. It was the confession of the wicked who after death must acknowledge the truth. The man informed me, every 30 days these people are brought up here to repeat their confession. Then they are cast back into Gehenna to smolder there like meat in a roasting pan. The sufferings of Gehenna bring home to the Rashaim that they send. Every month, Korach and his followers recognize the severity of their crime more profoundly, but they are returned to Gehenna to achieve an even deeper clarity of comprehension. The cycle continues until the resurrection of the dead, when they will have fully expiated their sin. Maybe soon in our days, resurrection of the dead, let's go. Okay, so what happened to the 250 men who stood with their pans of ketorit incense at the entrance of the Mishkan? A fire fell from the heaven and consumed them. They did not merit burial, but were completely erased. They were blotted out for the sin of joining a machlokit, a disagreement, a fight. Nevertheless, these 250 men were not swallowed by the earth. Hashem spared them from from that death because of their merits. Korach himself, however, received a twofold punishment. First, his soul was consumed by the heavenly fire, and then his body rolled toward the gap in the earth underneath his tent. Why did he incur both punishments? Had he not been burnt, those who were would have complained. He was the instigator of all of this balagan, all of this mess, but he suffered a lesser punishment than we. He was merely swallowed by the earth. Had he not been swallowed, those who were would have complained. It's not fair that Korach, the instigator of the rebellion, suffered lighter punishment, since each party imagines that someone else's punishment is less severe. Isn't that like human beings? Right. 
Now, however, everyone acknowledged God's justice. Did that make sense? It's a lighter punishment. Now, however, everyone acknowledged God's justice. Better. It, uh, it depends where the comma is. Moreover, Korach was punished. Mida. Kenegid. Mida. Measure for measure. He denied the veracity of the Torah that maintains heaven and earth, as it says in Yeremiah chapter 33, verse 25. If not for my covenant, the Torah, by day and night, I would not sustain the laws of heaven and earth. Therefore, he was punished with fire from heaven and being swallowed by earth. The 250 men saw how Korach's body, a veritable fireball, rolled towards the opening in the earth and disappeared inside. As soon as the sinners and their belongings had plummeted into the depths, the earth closed back. Its surface looked as smooth as ever, and not even the tiniest split was visible. No one could have been misled into thinking there was some kind of natural event that had occurred here, since after all, a natural event, a gap is detectable. Here, the earth miraculously acted like a living creature, opened its mouth to devour what it desired, and then completely closed again. When the earth opened, Bnei Israel were seized by panic, afraid lest they be swallowed as well. Even after the crack was sealed, the people continued scurrying and fleeing about in all directions. And from beneath the ground, they heard the sinners cry out, Help Moshe Rabbeinu, save us! Aaron's survival and the burning of the 250 men proved that Aaron was chosen for the kehuna, for the priesthood. The miracle of the earth swallowing Korach, Datan and Aviram, and their households manifested the truth of Moshe's calling. Now, interestingly, if you look at your book of Tehillim, of Psalms, Psalms, okay, some of these in fact, are written by the sons of Korach. How? What? What? How? Ah. How? How could it be? I thought all of his things got sucked into the black hole, into the middle of the earth. To Ganom. Maybe. When Korach was drawn into the abyss and his three sons, Asir, Elkanah, and Aviasaf, Two rolled down toward, uh, downwards. However, they were not drawn into the depth of Gehenna, but miraculously came to rest on a high platform that the Almighty had erected for them. Thus they remained alive. In what merit did the sons of Korach survive? In their hearts, Korach's sons were aware of the truth. When Moshe Rabbeinu came to visit Korach in his tent, while the family was sitting at the table, they thought, if we arise for Moshe, then we will offend our father. If we remain seated, on the other hand, we will transgress the mitzvah of arising for a Talmud Chacham, for a Torah scholar. We shall not violate a Torah commandment, even if father will be angry. Therefore, when Moshe Rabbeinu appeared at Korach's home, his sons stood up in his honor. Wow. Wow. When the destruction of Korach and his followers began, Korach's sons did teshuva. They made repentance in their hearts. Upon witnessing the earth splitting and swallowing their father and his followers, they were paralyzed with fear and unable to confess their sins orally. However, the Almighty, who knows a person's thoughts, saw their change of mind and therefore he allowed them to survive. The verse says, a song concerning the roses, B'nai Korach, Sons of Korach. Tehillim chapter 45 verse 1. Why does it term Korach's sons as roses? People who saw them used to remark, they are thorns just like their father. In the hour of destruction, however, Hashem guarded the roses from being burned together with the thorns. Korach's sons composed several psalms in the book of Tehillim. Among them, one in which they describe how they were almost confined to Ganom. My life draws near to Sheol. It's one of the levels of Ganom. It's the seventh level of Ganom. We talked about that already, right? My life draws near to Sheol. I am reckoned with those who go down to the pit. Tehillim, chapter 88. Okay. 
In chapter 49, they appeal to all mankind to learn the moral of their father's fate. Those who trust in their wealth and boast with the multitude of their riches, none of them can redeem his brother, nor give God a ransom for him. Do not be afraid when someone becomes rich, when the glory of his house is increased. For when he dies, he shall carry away nothing. His glory will not descend after him. Man has the option to obtain greatness by studying Torah and serving Hashem. Yet he understands not. He is like the beasts that perish, of which no remnant remains, whereas a Talmud Chacham's body will perish, but his soul will live forever. Okay, this is one of my super faves. Super faves. We're going to talk about On. On and his rocking wife. Ladies, you're going to enjoy this. Okay, so Korach had another follower, and his name was On. Um, and On had an amazing miracle worked for him. Okay, now On was a follower of Korach. On was from the tribe of Ruvain, which made him neighbors with Korach and his family. And as such, he ended up being drawn into the rebellion. When On returned home from the first meeting, he told his wife what had happened and that he was taking part in a revolt. She argued, what are you going to gain from it? Your position will be the same whether Aaron is the Kohen Gadol or whether Korach is the Kohen Gadol. What does it even have to do with you? He agreed to the logic of her words, but explained that he could no longer disengage himself from Korach's party since he had sworn at the meeting to join in offering Ketorit on the following morning. In order to rescue her husband from disaster, On's wife contrived a plan. She mixed a strong drink that put him to sleep, and then she and her daughter sat outside the tent. Picture this. They're sitting outside the tent. They uncover their hair. This is a wild thing. And as the men of Korach's group start to approach, and from afar they see these women sitting outside without their hair covered, they stop in their tracks, they turn around, and they walk away. <sighs> oh, man. And so after that, other messengers came, and the same thing happened. They wouldn't go near them. They turned around. It's just crazy. So... Korach had spoken well in depicting the nation of Israel as a holy congregation in whose midst is the Shekhinah. He was right. The Torah level of tzni'ut, of modesty, was accepted by the entire generation. It was a matter, of course, that even Korach's messengers would not address a woman whose hair was uncovered. When death struck... Oh, and I hope nobody's reading into anything. I just really love this story, and uh, I just think it's beautiful. I love, I love it. Okay. When death struck the Rashaim, the bed in which On slept began to slide toward the abyss. On's wife gripped its edge and prayed, Master of the universe, On has disassociated himself from Korach. He swore by your great name that he is not his follower. If he ever transgressed... If he ever transgresses his word, you can punish him. On was spared thereafter. <laughs> On was spared, and thereafter his wife reprimanded him. Now, go to Moshe and apologize. And appropriately so, if I do say so myself. And On said, I'm too embarrassed. I'm too embarrassed to go to Moshe Rabbeinu. On's wife then went to Moshe weeping bitterly and relating what had happened to her husband. Upon receiving her report, Moshe walked to On's tent and spoke to him encouragingly, saying, Come out, and may the Almighty forgive you. And for the remainder of his life, On did not cease from mourning and doing tshuva for having once sided with Korach. Beautiful. Moshe Rabbeinu is beautiful. And hey, you guys, if you're single out there, Get yourself a wife like the wife of Om Ben Pele. Okay? That is 
That's the kind of woman you want to build a house with. As it says in Eshet Chayel, a woman of valor. Wait, what does it say? I don't remember. Okay. All right. Oh, here we are. <laughs> wow. The wise one among the women builds her house. Mishle, Proverbs, chapter 9, verse 1. This refers to On's wife and daughter whose wisdom rescued their household from destruction. But the wicked woman demolishes it with her own hands, was taught in reference to Korach's wife, who ruined her husband and her household. Three other wives caused their husband's deaths. Chava, because she persuaded Adam Arishon to taste the fruit of the Etz Hadat. Dalila, who you will probably know as Dalala, who extracted from Shimshon, Samson, the secret of his power, and thereafter delivered him to his death. Wow, do I have this book out here? I have a book. I have a book called Samson's Struggle, The Struggle of Samson by Arya Kaplan, who's a super genius, amazing. Oh, if we're talking about Arya Kaplan, he wrote like a billion books. Uh, there's one called If I Were God. It's very short. If you can rent it from a library, find it, read it. It's just, it's a very big deal, and you will thank me. And the other book is called Samson's Struggle by Aria Kaplan. If I can remember, I'll put it in the description. But if you can rent it or find it, um, it will give you a totally different understanding of this story and how righteous Samson absolutely was and how human the story is as well. It's just chef's kiss. Okay. Now, so that's Chava, Delilah, Delila, and Queen Jezebel, which is funny because it's like Jezebel, which is like Jezebel is garbage. So she was very much like garbage. She influenced her husband, King Ahab, to perform wicked deeds. You'll find that in 1 Kings chapter 21. Very horrible. She's, she's horrible. But you know what? I'll say something interesting about. So it, I think, it, I believe, if you read about her, the way she ends up, right, because God works measure for measure, is that she was attacked by wild dogs and they ate her, I think. Uh, but they didn't eat her hands and her feet. Why? Because she had one mitzvah. And her mitzvah was when, when a couple was getting married, when they were getting married, she would go out and she would clap and dance and sing for the joy of the occasion. And in our faith, that is a very, very, very big mitzvah. Um, so she... She, but she was a horrible person. Mamash. Horrible. If you know the Nach. How good, how good are you guys at the Nach? What do you know about the books of the prophets? Me? We're going to find out. I can't wait till we start the Midrash on, on the prophets. That's going to be really good stuff. But first, let's not jump ahead of ourselves. How about I return to what we're talking about here? Now, On's wife prevented him from joining Korach, and Michal Bat Shaul. Who's Michal Bat Shaul? Shaul Amelech, King Saul, his daughter Michal, who was married to David Amelech, and she helped him escape um, from the trap that Shaul had set him. It's going to be in 1 Samuel. 1 Shmuel. Our sages have taught that a husband who follows his wife's advice in spiritual matters causes himself to fall into Genom. What's the source for that? 108. Baba Metzia? I don't know. Causes himself to fall into Gehenom. The husband is usually more expert at Torah matters. Moreover, a woman often seeks a higher standard of living, even at the expense of her husband's learning. 
which can cause him to do some questionable things. In practical matters, however, a husband should listen to his wife's advice. Um, now, interestingly, there are three things specifically where a husband should listen to his wife um, is where they should live, um, his friends, and um, with whom to do business. Now, that's not like, oh, I don't like that friend, so because I'm the woman and I, no, it's like sometimes women, right? They have this hush, this like feeling and intuition. You meet a guy and she's like, something, something's not, something's not with that guy. Something's off. You should listen to that. When it goes to going into business, business partners, friends, and where to live. Interestingly enough, the father gets the final word on where the children go to school. Now, <clears throat> the pans in which Korach and his 250 followers had offered Ketorit and could no longer serve for a profane purpose because they had all been consecrated for this avoda. In accordance with Hashem's commandment, Moshe instructed Eleazar, son of Aaron, to gather all the pans from the ashes, beat them flat, and form them a covering for the exterior altar. Why did Hashem assign the task of collecting the pans from the scene of the disaster to Eleazar rather than to Aaron? Korach had contested not only Aaron's position as a Kohen, but also Eleazar's position as a Kohen. Eleazar gathered the pans as a demonstration of his divine calling as a Kohen and eventually as a successor to his father as the high priest. Moreover, the Almighty did not direct Aaron to gather the pans of the sinners so as to avoid rumors that Aaron rejoiced to see the destruction of his opponents. In truth, Aaron was above any desire of revenge. His character was flawless, similar to an angel's. However, Hashem did not wish him to be needlessly suspected. What was the purpose of converting the pans of the rebels into a covering for the Mizbeach? What is a Mizbeach? Altar. Very good. This new covering would deter future generations from contesting the position of the Kahuna. Anyone arguing that a Jew from the family of non kohanim should be chosen as a Kohen would be warned. Hey, hey, you see that uh, copper altar over there? It's made from uh, the pans of the, the last guys that decided to, to rebel against Moshe and Aaron and the kahuna. And, well, they got burned and sucked up into the hole in the ground. Hashem informed Moshe, in the future, any non kohen who usurps the position of the kahuna will be smitten with tzarat on his face. Oh, it doesn't say that. I just made that up. He will be smitten with tzarat. <laughs> Since one reason for that Sarat is brought upon a person is the sin of claiming a position that is not his by right. Sarat, bad translation, leprosy. Good translation that's kind of lengthy is a specific spiritual element that manifests itself in flaky, dry, raw skin? Question mark? I don't know. How, how much is it? I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay. Hashem's word was fulfilled upon King Uziah. King Uziah understood the verse, and David's sons were Kohanim. Second uh, Samuel chapter 8. In, it, in its literal sense, Kohanim in this context implies that they were of noble rank. He inferred it from that kings are entitled to offer sacrifices just like Kohanim. How do you say sacrifices in Hebrew? Korbanot. Hence he entered the Bet HaMikdash to offer Ketorit. How do you say Ketorit in English? Incense. Very good. The angel, Michael, complained to Hashem, Master of the universe, you have appointed Aaron to minister before you below, just as you appointed me to minister above. You gave Aaron 22,000 Leviim to serve you, corresponding to the 22,000 angels that serve you in heaven. Unless you inflict a penalty upon Uziah, people will think that kings are permitted to perform the avoda just like Kohanim. Let him both be burned and swallowed up like Korach. Hashem immediately punished Uziah, as it says in 
I believe this is going to be called Second Chronicles. Chapter 26. And the Tzarat broke out on his forehead. Why did the plague manifest itself on his forehead first? He was smitten in the spot exactly where the Kohen Gadol's tzitz is. You know this gold headband we talked about? It's placed, boom, tzarat, tzarat right on his rosh, on his metzak. That's forehead in Hebrew. That's a new word for you. His metzak. He got the tzarat, boom, yashar, straight to his metzak. <laughs> that sounds funny. Okay. The Almighty thus publicized that he was not a Kohen. Boom. The morning after the death of Korach and his 250 men, an atmosphere of shock and oppression prevailed. The children of Israel had lost many of their great people, among them members of the Sanhedrin. Turning to Moshe and Aaron, the Jews accused them, You have caused the deaths of these 250 people. Why did you counsel them to offer the Ketoret? that it's fatal to anyone who offers it without an explicit divine commandment. Nadav and Avihu were also killed when they brought Ketorit without being commanded to do so. B'nai Israel's accusations constituted as Lashon Hara, slander. The Almighty immediately revealed himself in the cloud of glory to protect Moshe and Aaron, and he sent out an angel, I'm not going to say the name, to strike the people with the plague. Moshe and Aaron fell on their faces and they begged God not to punish the people. However, no words of prayer could even come out of their mouths. The Almighty, who grants men power of speech, prevented them from interceding for the sinners. Moshe therefore resorted to an emergency measure. Turning to Aaron, he ordered, Take the sacred pan for the offering of Ketorit and bring burning coals from the exterior altar and heap Ketorit upon them. Hurry to the camp and let the smoke of the Ketorit ascend to the heavens and this will stop the plague. Aaron looked at him in shock. He begged him, How am I allowed to take the fire of the holy altar to burn a torrent outside of the Mishkan? I will be perished. I will be killed just like my sons Nadav and Avihu. I will be perished. <laughs> Sorry. Hurry, Moshe urged. You are losing precious time. While you are talking, more Jews are dying. Aaron obeyed, thinking, I am ready to sacrifice my life for the nation of Israel. Moshe, the trusted prophet of Hashem, was empowered to take exceptional emergency measures. He commanded that the Ketorit be offered outside its usual place and at an unusual time. How did Moshe know that the Ketorit would end the plague? He had learned this secret when he had ascended to heaven to receive the Luchot Habrit, the two stone tablets. At the time, the angels protested to Hashem against entrusting his holy Torah to the hands of human beings. Moshe reasoned with them that God formulated the mitzvot of the Torah's Precisely for people with Yatsaharas, right? You are commanded to respect your parents. That can't be a mitzvah for angels. They don't have parents. We're commanded not to murder. It's not an issue for an angel not to murder. They don't have an incl inclination to want to murder. Keep the Shabbat. It doesn't have anything to do with them. The Torah doesn't have anything to do with them. Very interesting. There's a very whole fascinating midrash on this also um snaps i can't remember it there's a really good lecture bizrat hashem if i remember it by rabbi david aaron put it in the description that's very nice okay sorry where were we how did moshe know that the katorit would end the plague ah okay he At that time, the angels protested to Hashem against entrusting his holy Torah to the hands of human beings. Moshe reasoned with them that God formulated the mitzvot of the Torah precisely for people with Yetzir Hara. How did Moshe Rabbeinu know that the Ketorit would end the plague? He had learned this secret when he had ascended to heaven to get the Luchot, the two stone the two stone tablets. And at that time, the angels protested and they told Hashem, hey, why are you going to let this guy take the Torah? And Moshe was like, ah, it has nothing to do with you. It tells you to respect your parents. You don't even have parents. It tells you to not steal. You don't have an evil inclination to steal. Blah, blah, blah. So, you know, that's what's up.
Okay, so they protested against him and entrusting the Holy Torah into the hands of human beings. And Moshe reasoned with them that God formulated the mitzvot of the Torah precisely for people with the Yetzirah, with the evil inclination. The angels, though capable of studying secrets of Torah beyond that of man, do not need the mitzvot to protect them, perfect themselves. The angels acknowledged the wisdom of Moshe's argument, and to express their consent, they gave him special gifts. The angel of death taught Moshe a secret. If Moshe were to burn Ketoret while standing before him, he would be prevented from performing his work of destruction. Aaron brought the pan with the burning Ketoret to the camp and prayed, and with the Ketoret created a partition of smoke between the dead and the living. Aaron encountered the angel of death. Let me finish my work, said the angel of death. Do not stop me. Moshe has sent me to prevent you, said Aaron. The angel refused to obey. Aaron then seized him by force and brought him to the Oel Moed, and the plague ended. Our sages express in simple terms the concept of the angel of death had the power to perform his work because their sins acted as accusing angels against them, which made the Jews liable for the death punishment. The Ketoret, however, evokes the presence of the Shekhinah. Wow, I cannot speak today. The Ketoret, however, evokes the presence of the Shekhinah together with his tefillah, his prayer, our own... Our, our sages express in simple terms the concept that the angel of death had the power to perform his work because of the nation of Israel's sins. Their sins acted as accusers against them, making them liable for death. The Ketoret, however, evokes the presence of the Shekhinah. Together with his prayer, Tefillah, Aaron was able to overcome the accusations against Klal Yisrael. Thus, the angel's work was interrupted. When Rav Acha came to the village of Tarsha, the villagers heard of his arrival. A great man has arrived. Let us go ask him for help. They came before him and asked him, Our master, are you not worried about our misfortune? What's the matter? asked the rabbi. Death has come to the village a week ago, the people replied, and the plague does not come to a halt. He told them, let us go to the Beit Knesset, the synagogue, and beseech the Almighty for mercy. While they were walking, they were joined by other villagers who told of the victims who had just passed away and of many people who were fatally ill. The situation is grave, said the rabbi. Do as follows. Choose 40 men who are tzaddikim, righteous. I shall be among them. We will divide them into four groups of 10, and each group of 10 shall go to one corner of the village and recite there with concentration the Parsha of Ketoret. The Parsha are the sections of the Chumash, the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, that we divide up, that we read every week. And also that of the Korbanot. So they're going to take a Parsha that talks about the Ketoret and the Korbanot, and they're going to repeat it three times. They followed his instructions, and thereafter... He ordered, go to the houses where people are dying, separate them from living, from the living, and again recite the, the portions as you did before. Afterwards, say the verse, and Moshe said to Aaron, take the pen. And Aaron took, blah, blah, blah. And he stood between the dead, blah, 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 blah. And as soon as they had done so, the angel of death departed from the village. That night, Rav Acha heard in his sleep a heavenly voice that instructed him, now tell the villagers to do teshuva, you had the knowledge of how to drive away the angel of death, but know that these people are sinners, and therefore the punishment will yet come upon them again. Instruct them to make repentance and to take a change upon themselves and never to depart from Torah study. Also tell them to change the village's name, because a change of name is also a change of mazal. This is a very big concept. The change of name is also a change of mas The name of a person is considered to be like um, like a cliff note of his soul, like the building blocks of his or her soul. Um, even in the word neshama, I'm gonna put it on the screen, uh, nun, shin, mim, hey. Well, if you take that in the middle of neshama, soul is shim, it's a name. Your name is your soul. And so if you have a, well, if you have a name, now, again, 
if you need to do tshuva, changing your name is not going to do anything for you. But uh, something to think about anyway. It changes your mazal. Now, that would be poorly translated into luck. But mazal is like fortune. Well, I'm going to have to add something to this video because it's very hard to explain. I'm not going to get it. And fortune's not right. I'm going to have to check it out. So, where were we? So, the Ketorah was also chosen as the appropriate means to stop the plague because the Bnei Israel maligned it. They clamored, the Ketorah acts like a poison. It killed Nadav. It killed the view. And now it's destroyed 250 men. The Almighty responded, the Ketorah will now rescue Jews from death, thus demonstrating that it was not responsible for a person's death. What, what's responsible for a person's death is only their sins. When, through the burning of Ketorah, Aaron rescued the people from the plague, their claim was that the Ketorah had slain 250 men was disproven. The Jews complained that three holy objects brought death. The Ketorit. They grumbled. Through the Ketorit, Nadav and Avihu and Korach's followers were slain. The Aaron. People whispered. It slew the Plishtim, the inhabitants of the Beit Shemesh and Uzzah in King David's time. Right? Because if the Aaron was moving and somebody wasn't worthy to touch it, they just died immediately. And Moshe's staff. It was maligned as being responsible for bringing about the ten plagues of Egypt and the ten at the Yam Suf. Hashem caused each of these holy things to bring blessing upon Bnei Israel so that they should recognize their error. The Ketorit ended the plague, just as we talked about right now. The Aaron bestowed blessing and greatness upon the man, Ovid, whose house it stayed in for three months in 2 Samuel. In this short time, his family was blessed with numerous children who became distinguished Torah scholars. And in Masar Merivah, the Almighty ordered Moshe to hit the rock with the very rod which had brought about the plagues in Egypt. The rock gave forth water, thus forth giving life instead of taking life. And after the earth swallowed Korach, I'm going to wrap this up. Yeah, okay. After the earth swallowed Korach, Datan, and Aviram, it was clear beyond any doubt that Moshe was the divinely chosen leader. Aaron's divine calling as high priest, too, was manifested when the 250 men who contested his position were burnt alive. Nevertheless, some people continued to insist that Moshe should not have disqualified the firstborn from performing the avoda, assigning the service to the Leviim in their place. They desired that all the tribes would participate in the service through their firstborn. Hashem therefore performed a miracle that clearly demonstrated his selection of the tribe of Levi and thus put an end to all these claims. This miracle also reaffirmed Aaron's divine selection as Kohen Gadol. And to find out what that is, you're going to have to tune in next time, my friends. It has been a pleasure to be back here with you. Just want to bless all of us um, to be safe and to really prioritize the things that really matter in this crazy world and to see a revelation of redemption of Geula and peace peace in this world as always though my dear friends, it is so good to thank God.